Welcome to Go Solo Live. Don't you mean Go Solo Live? Have you ever been asked, why on earth would you travel alone? Go Solo Live not only answers that question, but celebrates life as a midlife solo traveler. This is a safe place for women to come together to reminisce about their travels, encourage others to travel, and to dig into the real lessons learned from these journeys. Now join Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel as she and her guests share stories of the solo travelers of midlife women. Before we get started, today I have two announcements about exciting things going on with Transform Via Travel. The first is the launch of our first group trip. I've partnered up with Kelly McDermott from A Path Less Taken, and we're planning an amazing trip to New Zealand in January 2019. For more information, go to bit.ly, bit.ly link, slash W-E-N-Z 2019. It's all lowercase letters, W-E-N-Z 2019. And follow us on Facebook at Transform Via Travel for more information about an upcoming question and answer webinar. Also, I've just launched an online program called Get Ready, Get Set, Go Solo, designed to help the first-time solo traveler get unburied from all the research and actually start traveling. For more information about the online program, go to bit.ly slash ready, set, solo. That's bit.ly slash ready, set, solo. And that information will also be included in our show notes. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Hello, sisters, and welcome to Go Solo Live. This is Jennifer Buchholz so Transform Via Travel. It's time to sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy my conversation with Lee McAdams as we talk about the different challenges that face American solo travelers versus those from other countries like her native Canada. Joining me today is Lee McAdams, and she's actually Canadian-based, living in Calgary, which is going to lend to a very interesting part of our show today. Welcome, Lee. Well, thank you for having me, Jennifer. I'm so excited. We started a conversation off air that I'd like us to get right into because to me, it actually gets to the heart of some of the things that I've been trying to portray on the show. I often talk about how I put stories out of midlife American solo traveling women because I believe that there's a real distinct nature of being an American female solo traveler. Now, there's a lot of things we would have in common with people from all over the world, but there are some systemic differences. And we started that conversation off the air. I'd love for you to share a little bit about what is your experience as a solo traveler or just a traveler in general when you're coming to America and some of the things that you do to prepare. And we'll talk about how that flows into the opposite. Okay, so the first thing I think of when I'm going to the United States is medical costs. And that could be as something as simple as you have a bad infection or a bad cold and you just need to see the GP for 10 minutes, but you don't know how much it's going to cost you. But that's the low end of the scale. Then I think, what if I've driven across the border into Montana and I get in a car accident and it's going to set me back a half a million dollars? Could I race back to a hospital across the border in Calgary and still be okay? So one of those things as a Canadian, I do not feel that I'm limited in where I travel because I have travel insurance for six months, no matter what. I'm complete, well, not 100% covered, but I have very good coverage. Whereas having lived in the United States for 10 years, I understand some of the issues that you're actually facing. Not having health insurance is huge. I mean, it's big for Canadians. So to back up a little bit, I would make sure that I have health insurance. Even if I'm going to the United States for two hours, I would not go down without health insurance. And I was saying to you, Jennifer, that one of the big things for us is like credit cards have, I think it's $25,000 or $50,000 of health insurance. So it's a nice baseline to work with. I think we're pretty lucky in that respect. And I'll pay my extra taxes so I don't have to think of that. But that's a Which whole other discussion. Big, right. It is a whole other discussion. <laughs> but this begs the question, because a lot of people will say, why do you focus on American solo travelers? And two things. First of all, that our health insurance system is so entirely different than many other parts of the world. So when I run into people with countrywide health care, that they don't have to be employed at a certain job for X amount of time in order to have health coverage. Especially for women in midlife, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, but, and especially for women in midlife, because at that stage of life, there may be pre-existing conditions that you now have. And, yep. you know, maybe not so in your 20s, but maybe in your 40s, there's something that now has come up. And, you know, to travel the world with that pre-existing condition and 
be worried about cost is just seems like an onerous burden and rather unfair in the whole scheme of things. You know, I'll have people, I have had arguments, and I don't, maybe that's not the right word, a discussion <laughs> with Americans for sure about, you know, getting taxed and having free health care versus not. But I do think what you're having to think about and what I think about are two very different entities when it comes to travel. Until 20 minutes ago, I had not put myself in your shoes thinking about travel in that way. So it's very interesting. And I appreciate that. What's been also my lessons learned myself, I have only had to pursue the medical assistance in New Zealand. So at least I was able to speak the language. I knew when I got on that flight that I wasn't feeling great. By the time I landed, I had strep throat and I thought I'd tough it out, couldn't do it. And first question I started asking was, do you guys need a prescription for antibiotics? And once I figured out the answer was yes, I went to a walk-in clinic. I paid $250, which was very reasonable for a visit and for my prescription and walked away. And I felt grateful that I didn't have to jump through as many hoops. So again, your conversation and sharing with me about what it's like to come from Canada and travel in the U.S. and the exorbitant cost of healthcare and the risk associated with that is interesting as well. But I'm a huge proponent of travel insurance. And one of the women in my travel meetup recently got back from Spain where she was hospitalized for three days with an unknown issue. You know, she's 50 plus years old and it was really challenging. So she's actually asked that we start having some more open conversations about what do we do? How do we prepare in advance? How do we take care of ourselves when we're traveling? And then when you are faced with medical issues, when you're traveling, what are the best ways to handle them? Oh, that's so true. And you know, I mean, it becomes a whole, we wouldn't even get into travel discussions today, but it becomes a much bigger issue. I mean, you think about all the people that are now traveling around the world just for medical surgery. People are going to countries where surgery is performed inexpensively to get away from the high cost. And the list just goes on and on about the problems that people can have. But I think with the insurance, one of the issues that I have is, you know, reading that fine print and are you covered and exactly what are you covered for? And sometimes you almost need a lawyer to be able to interpret that kind of stuff. And I, yes. you know, I, I think you have to be so careful. And especially just before you go on a trip, you know, you're trying to take care of yourself. You check in with your doctor. Maybe your prescription gets changed with the dosage. And just by changing that dosage, I have heard some travel insurance companies will then negate your policy. So you really have to be very, very careful also of what you do. What a predicament to be in. The basic line is we have to stay healthy. We do have to stay healthy and for people to be aware and prepared themselves when yeah. traveling so that I know when I've gone to a big trip, I have gone to my doctor in advance and we've talked about what do I need to do to prepare and making sure that she knows that I'm traveling. Yeah. All those things do make a difference and it doesn't matter how much better in some ways our healthcare system is getting. In terms of access, I have people who are using call in to get some prescriptions or call in doctor visits, which is great there's still a lot of opportunity for us to improve. So one of our topics was this healthcare thing, which is fascinating and a good conversation to pursue in general as to why it is different for Americans to travel solo. The other thing yeah. we started to talk about was time off work. And actually, I would also even almost challenge what time off really looks like because I know people who can get four weeks of vacation and they can go travel, you know, for a couple of weeks, but they're still not even always allowed to truly disconnect. Well, I think Canadians generally tend to use up all their vacation time. And there was a study, and I don't know where it came out of, but I read it in the last couple of weeks about how little vacation time Americans are actually using. So even if they're allowed their two weeks and 10 days off, they're not even using it because they're scared that they'll be left behind when they leave. I think that's a very American thing. I think most of the rest of the world is just like, let's get out of here. Let's go have some fun. And we're not so worried about someone taking our place. And, you know, there are very few jobs in Canada, unless it's a very low level entry level position where it starts at two weeks. And, you know, many start at three weeks. And, you know, we're not Germany, that's for sure, getting right. eight weeks off. But we're certainly, I think, four weeks. Three to four weeks is very normal. And then a lot of places are closed between Christmas and New Year's as well. And that doesn't even get included in the count for days off. So that's Absolutely. a real bonus, too. So it creates an entirely different mindset. And there's a little bit more opportunity to go to certain places at a certain time. For us, I don't know if you guys have 
this type of situation with time off in general. But in many cases for us, two week time period off of work has to be requested up to a year in advance. Yeah, that's craziness, isn't it? And trying to plan (laughs) your life that far out. I guess you can take advantage of all your frequent flyer points should you have any. But you know, other than that, like where's the spontaneity in life? And that's part of what travel is all about too, I think. You live in a part of the world where it's snowy and dull in the winter, and so do I. And sometimes you've just had it. And what you want to do is hop on a plane and go away for a week or two. Agreed. So that spontaneity is lost in some ways. Now, trust me, we find it. It's not like all hope is lost for American women travelers. But Oh, by no means. <laughs> But I would also say that some of that system and structure and therefore, and this is what was more interesting as we kept talking off air, was generationally, this has not been supported, encouraged, and the system hasn't really allowed for it. So we're so far away from thinking that it's possible. That's why we started sharing these stories and why you've started doing some of the work that you do, because Mm -hmm. it's showing people that there's a version of normal that includes solo travel. (laughs) Absolutely. And you know, I started solo traveling within days of finishing university. And, you know, I certainly don't solo travel only now, but I do. I'm married. I have had a spouse for decades, but I still love solo travel. And, you know, and it's interesting where you get your start and do you hang on to it? Because I know lots of women who started off as solo travels, but aren't anymore. You know, it's your comfort zone as well. Without a doubt. Now, tell me, you started solo travel right out of university. How is it different for you now than it was then? I think wisdom about not making stupid mistakes, like getting in a truck as a hitchhiker in Australia. Very stupid mistake. I think I'm a lot smarter about my choices. And I'm probably not as flexible as I used to be. You know, you'd sleep anywhere because wherever you could get a free night's rest, that was a bonus. I don't think like that now. But I think it's the flexibility, but I also think that I'm still really open to all new experiences. And that's who I am. I'm a curious person and that has never changed. And I think that just on my first trip, that just started my lifetime of travel because I wanted to fill in the blanks on the map and that curiosity wasn't satisfied. It was just came back tenfold, hundredfold, and I don't think it'll ever leave me, which is, I think, a very good thing. That sounds wonderful. I'd love to hear how you got started, because where you got started is in some of the places in the world that I love. Can you tell us a little bit about your trips to Fiji, New Zealand, and Australia? And since you were there for quite some time, what was that like for you? It was actually great. You know, it was one of those, I'd saved up, I'd had a good job all summer, so I'd had enough cash. And this was way before internet. This is, you know, slow mail. So when you say goodbye to your parents at the airport, They are not hearing from you unless you happen to send them, you know, one of those blue envelopes with a letter inside it. (laughs) So it would be months before they would know where I was. And I think that's kind of an aside, but it's hard to imagine letting our kids go off like that these days. And, you know, let us know where you are in four months and we're all good. That just doesn't happen anymore. So it was complete freedom of the road. I decided I'd go to Australia, New Zealand and Fiji with a stop in Hawaii because that sounded so romantic and so unusual from where I grew up. And, you know, I was English speaking, so I thought it would be easy travel. And I didn't know what I was getting into. And I think at that age, I was probably 21. You don't know what you're getting into. And had a blast from day one. And I think that is the beauty of solo travel is being open to so many new experiences. And because you don't want to be alone for month after month on end alone, you are way more open to meeting new people and just going with the flow. I've got a few stories, but we can get into those eventually. (laughs) Well, again, what I really like, and I've been having more of these conversations with people, is the way it used to be in terms of that travel. And you were really not in communication with back home. So your only option, you had to adapt. And if you didn't want to be on a solitary trip, which who wants to do that, you engage and, well, and you become very self-reliant and, you know, you have to look after yourself. And I, you know, I don't know what went through my parents' head. I can't actually imagine <laughs> my kids at this stage, you know, oh, I'll hear from you. Whereas, it, you know, if my daughter gets on a plane, it's, you know, let me know when you get to Madrid. I just want to know you're safe. And I feel like the coddled generation, right? That's what I've got. But we've got a bunch of people that have, you know, we've taken such a concern that I don't know that they have the resiliency that I think the older people have. And I, maybe I'm sounding like an old codger right now. I hope not. Well, but I do think you learn resiliency when you've had to deal with all the problems and no one is there to help you. 
you're absolutely right. And we have created this. So that's the actual bigger challenge to me is there's no going back. What, no. do, we, what do we do <laughs> to continue? Because I know when I was supervising a study abroad to New Zealand and we told the 20 year olds that they would be without cell phones for three days, I believe we were going to be out of place. And the kids knew it. Everybody knew it going forward, but the kids were thrilled. Oh, they, they were, were thrilled. Very, yes. They oh, were very happy to not have to, they could just be, but the yes. parents were freaking out. Oh, it was the parents. So it's our generation that's screwing things up, actually. <laughs> Whereas I think that's the best thing for the kids because there are no, you know, there's no social media. You can actually talk to your, the person yep. you're sitting beside. It, it makes you engage and communicate again, doesn't it? It certainly oh, does. And someone else just had that same conversation with me of when we want our children to not have their phones on in school and they shouldn't need their phones in school. And when they do a study to figure out, well, who's contacting the kids in school? It's the yeah. parents. Seriously. Oh, dear. Yep. <laughs> we have a problem with the parents, not the kids. And why do we have that problem? What are parents so afraid of? You know, I don't know what that is. I don't know why we're so fearful. It says a lot about what our expectations are now. You know, we expect kids to be able to immediately respond. So they're conditioned yep. to mm -hmm. immediately respond. And until we take that step back and look at the whole system and how it got to where it is and why, then mm -hmm. we're like, oh, those darn kids are always on their phones. You know, I had a different experience. I mean, and I certainly appreciate that that is absolutely fact. I was on a press trip and I was with some younger bloggers in their 20s. And I know we had the better part of a day where we were off doing things and we weren't on our phones. And the one girl, you know, it's like, I have to get into the hotel room. I need some oxygen. And she was referring to being on her phone. That was her oxygen, which I thought was a very interesting term. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a surprise. Again, it's something that we really have, I don't know, as a world, you know, and in nowadays, we're making our phones more and more capable of things that they can do. That's so right. why not have these expectations? Well, you know, and I've been invited to go up into the mountains one day in June with the idea of doing this Facebook live presentation. And I'm thinking, you know, I actually like to go up to the mountains where my phone doesn't work. And I can be away from humanity and don't have to think about anything other than just enjoying nature. And I think I'll go with this guy just to see what it's like. But it has no appeal to me whatsoever. But to who will it have appeal? And it will have huge appeal because then no one can be ever out of touch. Well, and I'm with you. I feel like it's counterintuitive to mm -hmm. be in this place where you're supposed to be engaging with nature. And yes. we're really engaging with technology. Exactly. Well, you know, I've also been invited up to Denali National Park um, this summer in Alaska to this lodge. Wonderful. And, you know, part of it is I have to write blog posts and do some social media. So I said, you know, do you have a signal so I can get Instagram posts out every day for you? And it's like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. No, we don't want you doing any social media while we're up here. We want you to focus on just the experience. It's like, I am good with that. I am so all over that. I will not even bring my phone. So how refreshing is that? I was thrilled a bit. That sounds fantastic. It's so That's nice. That, and I mean, I'm hearing people doing these totally disconnected types of trips and things like that, which is great. But it's interesting that we actually now have to travel in a way to disconnect from our technology because we're so tethered to it. Yes. You know, as just as a travel blogger, what expectations are when you're on a trip? And sometimes, you know, you're not even living the moment because you're so tied to getting that tweet out or that Facebook share. You know, so I'm starting to push back a little bit more with people too about I want to experience happy to share whatever I need to share after the trip. And it just makes the experience that much richer for me. Well, I would love for us to hear a little bit more about your adventures. We've talked a lot about our <laughs> philosophies or other projects <laughs> that have going on, which is great. But I want people to be able to connect a bit with who you are as a travel blogger and what's going to make them want to read what you're doing right now. Well, hopefully people will come to my site. I got into this blogging business nine and a half years ago, maybe. And, you know, sold a company, decided my passion for travel was going to take me on a new journey. I didn't know how that was all going to look at it. It took me a long time to figure out that my niche was going to be the outdoors, nature, and adventure, because that's really who I am. And it's not that I don't love a great glass of wine and a great meal, but I don't need to write about that. And there's enough other people doing that. But I do want to show people places in the world that they perhaps wouldn't necessarily hear about that aren't as mainstream as others. And I do want to show people that 
just because you're a middle-aged woman does not mean that you are all washed up and you can't be hiking and doing some really hard things. Like, why not? And I don't want people to be held back because of age. And I really do think it's a number and I'm getting up there and I have no desire to quit until I'm 90. That's where it all started. So if you think outdoor adventure, I hope people think of hike, bike, travel at some point. That's great. So you've talked about Denali coming up on your list. What are a couple of the things you've done most recently that people would be interested in? This was soft adventure, but I'm going to still mention it because you say the word bears and people get scared. I went up to the northern end of Vancouver Island and flew in a small float plane and went to this lodge for grizzly bear viewing. And so that was rather a thrilling experience to see grizzlies in their natural habitat and actually see the most massive male grizzly I've seen. And well, it was just humongous playing with female and just not mating, but just almost having an affectionate time with another animal. And it was a very magical experience. And I think a lot of people are so afraid of bears that, you know, that kind of trip appeals because it's done in a safe way. And that was truly interesting and remarkable. And back in February, I went to Morocco. And Um, again, that was, you know, I didn't know what to expect with Morocco because I'd heard such mixed reports from people that had gone online and offline as well. And we ended up hiring a guide who was a nomad from the Sahara Desert. So we had this incredible experience. And now this wasn't solo travel, this was with my husband, but just having an experience where you saw Morocco through the eyes of someone who really lived in very primitive shelters. They were really shelters for most of his life and how he had taken himself from being a Bedouin to driving a car, speaking seven languages, communicating on Facebook. I mean, it was mind blowing. Those are not my hardcore adventures. Those are my soft ones, but they were pretty cool. Very exciting. Now, you know, it doesn't have to be hardcore because I think what's really different is what you're bringing is that you're doing things that most would not do. You know, that's generally what I like. And I think that's why some of the marketing organizations target me. It's like, oh, we've got a female. We've actually got a female who's older, who will do these wild ass things. And, you know, well, yes, sign me up. I say anything but bungee jumping. Oh, <laughs> Bungee jumping, just I'm worried about my back. I don't want to be a paraplegic. So I get (laughs) the same fear. Yeah, I just that's I really am quite prepared to try most things. And so, you know, like there's canoeing trips in northern Canada and it's like, oh, let's ask Lee. She'll go. And really, that's kind of the bottom line is I love to do those things where you're in a tent and you're out there and there's nobody around for maybe a thousand kilometers if you're really lucky. But that's not to say I don't like city stuff. I just don't like it as much. Well, now I'd like to hear who are some of the unique people that you're running into, whether it's on a trip where you're traveling with other, you know, travel bloggers or influencers, or Mm -hmm. when you're out, you know, on an adventure and it's just another person who's out adventuring with you. What are some of the different types (laughs) of people you're running into? I think I'm open to meeting new people on the road. And as I say to my husband sometimes, like he'll talk to everybody and anybody. He does understand social nuances and knows how to read people, but he's also very curious. You know, if we're in a restaurant, we're in a hotel, we definitely talk to people there. But one of my more interesting ones actually was occurred here in Calgary. And I was on a panel discussion and we were talking hiking in Alberta, basically. And the fellow beside, I was thinking, oh my gosh, look at the company I'm with. So the fellow beside me had soloed Everest without oxygen, which is pretty darn amazing. And to top it all off, he had rowed across the North Atlantic solo. And I'm thinking, wow, like, you know, these are such out there adventures that very few people can relate to them. You can be in awe of someone like him, which I am, but I can't relate to doing something like that. And then on the other side of me, I have the guy who does those ultra marathons and is running 100 miles through the mountains. Again, something I cannot relate to. I think all of us like to live vicariously through people like that. You know, we truly admire what they do, but 99.9% of us are never going to live like that. And I think I try and do things that are fairly, they're mainstream or they could be mainstream if you allow yourself to do it and just go do it and not put up all the roadblocks that you normally do. Well, and so often our instinct is how many reasons why we can't. Oh, 100%. You know, you've, you've always got an excuse. And it's I'm trying to do it the other way is how can I do whatever I'm trying to do? Well, you know, what are the roadblocks to take away so I can go do that trip? And sometimes it's learning a new skill. But once you've learned that new skill, what an empowering thing that is. 
And so I hope, and I do know I've influenced some people. I don't know how many people, but it always feels good. Even if it's one person that says, I did this trip because of you and thank you very much. Well, that's a great. Right? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I always feel good with that. You know, some of it's hiking trips and they just haven't put themselves out there. And they've gone to a backcountry hut and it's like, oh, it wasn't so hard. I didn't get lost. You know, it wasn't the scary situation I thought it was going to be. Love it. Yes, me too. (laughs) Now, how did you actually transition into doing the travel blog and becoming an influencer? Oh, I think it was just, what do they say? Content, content, and content. And I can't, uh, there were so many years that I was just going to give up because I wasn't on press trips. And, you know, my blog is just not doing all that well. And I'm not a techie person. So, you know... And I didn't have a core group of people to run ideas by. But I moved from Vancouver to Calgary, and there was a much better group of people here in Calgary that were awesome about sharing their knowledge. And so I kept putting out content. And I think the content was good, but the pictures were awful. So I went and took a whole bunch of courses at night school for photography courses. So improved photography. And, you know, I continue to improve my photography. People are visual. So If they're really interested in something, they'll read it, but otherwise they'll scan, they'll look at your picture and move on. But it's the picture that usually draws someone in. So I knew that had to be high up there. And then I've written 1,200 posts now, and I've probably deleted about 300 posts that I thought were (laughs) awful because that's what you do. You know, every year I delete all the really bad ones and keep some other ones. And then some or other, you know, Google's managed to find me. So my numbers are good and I'm on social media. And I guess I've written two books now. So that, or been a co-author on one of them, but that gets your name out there. And it also gives you credibility. And so I think that was the really big step was the credibility after writing my first book. Sure. Aside from the travel, what's next for you as you continue to grow in your work? You know, I was asked if I'd consider being a co-author for a third book, and it's like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. It feels like you're back in university days with an exam always to think about, and I find that hard to do. I'd like to double my numbers with my blog. I want to see it grow and get bigger, and I just want to keep experiencing the world as an adventurous person. But I don't want to give up my blog at all, and I want to see if I can, you know, I'd love to hit the like 400,000 page views a month kind of thing if I could do that. And so I set these goals strictly for myself and I'll never get rich doing what I'm doing, but I feel like I'm so rich in experiences because of my blog. That's really exciting. Now, do any blogging conferences or anything else where you connect with others who are doing similar things? Yes, I belong to a couple of travel media groups. So there's one, there's actually a conference that I'm not attending right now in Victoria with the Travel Media Group of in Canada. And so I will go to next year's conference. So I do do the odd conference. And that has been fantastic for networking and getting your name out there. You know, there, I know there's a big travel meeting in New York City at the end of January. And, it's, you know, do you put that on your wish list and go meet people that are both bloggers and industry? I think those are really key and important groups to meet up with. And TBEX was one of the early ones, and that's Travel Bloggers Exchange, I think. And that's really evolved, but I feel like that's mostly a very young crowd. And so I've tended not to be as involved in that one. And SATW, you probably know that one, Society of American Travel Writers. They have a Canadian chapter, so I belong to that. It's really fitting in the time for conferences and deciding whether it's worthwhile. Well, and then I always love to figure out if I'm going to a conference, how do I add on some sort of adventure on either end of that conference where I attend? Oh, completely. Well, and some of the conferences are great because they'll add on a pre-tour or a post-tour. And depending on the conference, that may be an all expenses paid pre-tour or post-tour. So that's a real bonus when that happens. Gotta love it. I love it. Now, if you were talking to someone who has not yet experienced solo travel, There's always the just do it kind of thing. But what other things would you say would help them get over the hump and just do it? I think it's learning to have confidence in yourself and the decisions you make. And to, I mean, and it's such an easy thing to say, but to put your fears aside. And I always say, what's the worst that can happen to me? And I do that with any time I'm dealing with media too, like this radio interview. What's the worst that could happen? I'm doing TV. What's the worst that can happen? And so I think if you go in with that attitude and, you know, you're going to come out, it's all going to work out. And I mean, that sounds so trite in so many ways, but it's true. And being positive and smiling a lot opens a lot of doors. And I think you just have to trust your instincts as well. Does that help? I love it. The idea of what's the worst that can happen. And then 
plan accordingly. If that truly is a legitimate fear versus just something in your head, then plan for the worst. Yeah, exactly. And then do it anyway. You know, what's the worst that can happen? You can die. That's the worst that can happen. Or you can get yeah. very ill or hurt yourself. So to me, let's back up from there and figure out, okay, if your feelings get bruised, well, you can live with that. If you have a bad experience and you get pickpocketed or you lose things. I mean, yes, that's awful, but it's not the end of the world. And I think you don't avoid a whole country because you've heard of someone having one or two bad experiences. That happens anywhere in the world. And, and I think you have to see the good in the world rather than the bad in the world, because you can find the bad. It's everywhere, but there's also lots of good out there. You well, just have to go discover it. I think that we have risk in our own backyard. If we don't ever leave that, I think we've closed the world off to ourselves. And that You know, Jennifer, I completely agree with that one. Well, I can't believe how quickly our time has gone. Please make sure that everybody knows where to find you. Where are you on social media and what is your blog name? And we'll put that in the show notes as well. Okay. Well, thank you. My blog is hikebiketravel.com and all my social media handles on Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, Hike Bike Travel. And honestly, if this is 35 or 40 minutes and it's over, we've had a great conversation because I've thoroughly enjoyed it and it's gone very fast. I agree. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Wasn't it great to hear the stories that Lee shared with us today? I want you to keep in mind that no matter what age, when you start being open to solo travel experiences, it opens the world to you. Now, if you love these stories and want to help support Go Solo Live, you can do that by making a small financial contribution to the show at patreon.com slash go solo live. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash go solo live. Thanks again for showing the love. We've reached the end of another episode, but the conversation doesn't have to end there. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Go Solo Live. And until next time, remember, go solo, not alone.